Hello and welcome to another episode. This is episode nine of Quest for Truth. Your, um, what are we again? We are the hosts, yes, uh, of uh, this show. Rob Skiba and myself, Douglas Hamp. We're excited to be with you. Yeah. Yeah, boy, we're, we, we decided, hey, let's go through Revelation. It's taken us, what, three weeks now to get through chapter one. <laughs> um, but it's exciting. I'm, I'm really actually enjoying this. Um, I, I do have to say, for those who didn't check uh, the show notes afterwards, that I was wrong. And uh, it's kind of funny. Uh, I'm going to put something up here on the screen. Doug mentioned <laughs> uh, on one of the uh, threads on Facebook on our Quest for Truth Facebook page, which, by the way, if you haven't joined, please go to Quest for Truth with the number four in Facebook there and like us, and uh, you can interact with us there on Quest for Truth uh, Facebook page. But this, uh, <laughs> I put important update. I, Rob, was wrong about something, and it generated 73 responses. So Doug suggested I just go ahead and start off everything by saying I'm wrong. <laughs> so, uh, it, but I was wrong. I said the Council of Nicaea. It was actually the uh, third Council of Carthage. And if you go to our questfortruth.net webpage, Quest for Truth with the number four, and then click on the Quest for Truth episode eight. I put a rather lengthy explanation to uh, help solidify my position. Uh, so if people want to check that out, I want to make that clear for everybody that didn't get a chance to see that, uh, that I put a note in that regard. But uh, we're ready to jump back in, and uh, I think we're on verse 20, maybe, something like that. Of yeah, one. we've been having a... This has been great. It's been a lot of fun. Well, yeah, let's just jump in. The mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the seven angel, angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands, which you saw, are the seven churches. All right, according to the New King James Version. Hmm. All right, well, so here's Jesus. He's got these seven stars in his right hand. And, um, you know, this is going to be really important when we go through the rest of the book of Revelation because we read a lot about stars, and very often uh, stars have been interpreted as being like the stars way up in the sky, those bright things out there. And, you know, Jesus here is giving us the key to understand what the stars are. And for me, it's become uh, very important because, you know, when you come over to Revelation chapter 6, for example, and it says there in verse 13, he says, And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Now, I, I see this as not the stars... Um, you know, way up in the sky or even comets or meteorites fall into the sky. But when you understand this in, in light of what Jesus is saying about the, the seven stars of these seven angels, then I would argue that this is talking about the, uh, the fallen angels uh, who are going to fall to the earth. And then we pair that with Revelation chapter 12 where you see the the dragon takes a third of the stars with his tail and he casts them to the earth and then we're told very clearly that those are in fact the uh, the, the angels, uh, Satan's angels that, are, that he takes with him. In fact we see in Revelation chapter 12 and war broke out in heaven, Michael and his angels fought with the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought and it says the dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan etc. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. You pair that with Revelation 12:14. He drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragons stood before the woman, etc. So, you know, that right there. And then, just one more thing, and I'll, I'll give the mic back to you, Rob. Uh, in Revelation chapter 8, uh, starting in verse 10, it says, and I saw a great star fall from heaven, burning like a torch. And then it says it fell, fall on, it fell on the, the, the waters, and its name was Wormwood. So I see the great star as being Satan, who falls to the earth. These other stars of heaven that we see in Revelation 6.13 are, in fact, the fallen angels. So... You know, I think, you know, certainly that has changed the way I have understood the book of Revelation. I used to think it was meteorites, etc., but uh, now I see you're going to have lots and lots of fallen angels on the planet. It's going to be a pretty scary place. Well, but do you see the angels in Revelation 120 as fallen or good or as simply messengers as in possibly the pastors of the seven churches? 
Well, I would see them as good angels, as in, you know, heavenly beings. Uh, I, I do not see them as pastors. I know that is a interpretation. Uh, I do not receive that interpretation. I understand that the word angelo, angelos in Greek can mean a messenger. And, uh, you know, there's maybe a handful of places where you could interpret it that way. Um, you know, but usually we see... Uh, different words that are being used to describe uh, human uh, people such as uh, ambassadors or apostles or disciples or pastors or something but uh, to, to suggest that these are you know simply and, and even suddenly that these are just humans I, th I think is kind of missing the point especially when there's so much talk about angels in this whole book to to suggest that these are only talking about you know that these are only talking about uh human agents i think uh is is really missing missing the point and you know even when you, when you think about all the angels i mean this there's a lot of stuff going on with angels in the bible and and you know this is one of these places where we see that there's actually um you know there are these angels that are over these different churches. I mean, that's pretty interesting, actually. You know, just like there's an angel over, uh, and, and of course, a bad angel, as it were, over Persia. There's a bad angel over the the area of Greece. We know that Michael, a good angel, is over the land of Israel. We read later in Revelation 16 that there is an angel over the waters, and so you know, here we have the seven angels again these heavenly beings that are over the seven churches. So, you know, that's that's definitely how I, I would read that. I, I don't read it uh, as anything else. Yeah, I would tend to agree with you. I mean, it's, it's bizarre that if it's talking about pastors that he would use the word that he used there uh, because you're right. There are plenty of other words he could use there uh, in its place. But he's just talking about pastors. I mean, even using the word pastor, uh, you know, would make more sense. Uh, what I just want to throw out there uh, as an interesting observa observation perhaps is as I was looking at this the seven stars um, there's another set of seven stars that are mentioned in the Bible and that would be in Job 9.9 9 and Job 38.31 regarding the Pleiades which is of course a seven star system and people can read all about that but I've always been intrigued by that because uh, it seems to show up quite a bit in, in a lot of different uh, you know mythologies and stuff like this, the Greek mythologies of Pleiades and whatnot. Uh, but of course, the way it's referred to in the Bible in Job nine, uh, Octurus, Orion, and the Pleiades. But there's that really kind of interesting verse there in Job thirty-eight thirty-one: "Canst thou bind the sweet influence of the Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion?" Um, I don't really know exactly what to make of that, but when I saw the seven stars being referred to uh, in Revelation 120, it made me think about that anyway. I don't know if there's any connection whatsoever to it or not, but uh, just uh, an interesting observation anyway. Hmm. Yeah, I don't have uh, I don't have any comment on that. I've not really given that uh, much thought. Uh, I haven't given any thought, to be honest. <laughs> so I don't know. That's uh, that's a fascinating idea. Well, you know, the whole thing about about angels representing stars or stars representing angels uh, is something that, you know that we see quite a bit. Uh, certainly, Job thirty-eight seven. You know, where were you, Job, when um, you know while the morning stars sang together and all the divine beings shouted joyfully? That's uh, the international standard versions. Uh, take on that, or you can also read it uh, in the King James, uh, New King James. There it would be when the um, when the sons of God shouted for joy. So you see, morning stars and sons of God are equated as being one and the same. So you know that's uh, it. Really, you see you see angels being used quite a bit uh, in or, or stars being used quite a bit in place of angels. Even in think, Daniel, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was, well, just, I was just gonna ask, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So my turn. Uh, and I'm in sorry. Daniel chapter eight, it says, "And it grew up to the host of heaven, mm -hmm. and it cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them." Mm -hmm. You know. So this, it, it really, it really just uh, goes with that. Let me just give you one more verse here in Isaiah 14:13. 
Satan says, he says, um, he says, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, mm -hmm. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation. And then I would pair that with Psalm 82, where you have God sitting in the midst of the, uh, the divine assembly, mm -hmm. and here are the stars of God in Isaiah 14, 13, here above the stars of God, it's not talking about the, you know, the, the bright shining gas things that are above God's head, but it's talking about these stars, these angels, uh, of which Satan, you know, is is the this bright star. He's known as Lucifer or Halel in the Hebrew. Uh, but you know, he, I I just see so many places where stars is really referencing, um, re referencing angels. So all right, your turn. Right. No, I'd agree with you. And in, in fact, I was going to mention some of the scriptures, the very ones you you brought up right there, like where you see that this this entity goes up against the 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 angels are the hosts of heaven and the stars and and I forget the reference it's in there's there's some interesting references in the book of Enoch that also talks about an association with angels and stars and my question is do you think that there actually is a connection a physical connection to those bodies we see up in the sky and angels well I think the only connection is that they shine uh, the words, hmm. you know, a star is something that is shining. Uh, that's that's what makes it, uh, you know, shining. Of course, when the when the angels show up at Jesus' birth, they they illuminate the sky. They're so bright. So that is, you know, that is the the quality that they have. Um, Do you think the star that um, the, that the magi followed was in fact a host of angels? You know, I, I've I've kind of wondered about that. I, I know that uh, some have have suggested no, it has to be an actual star. You know, like the thing that's up in the sky that we see at night. Uh, but I I would suggest that, considering how many times we see the word star used for angel, I think an angel floating around would actually would simplify matters quite a bit. And you know he can kind of go anywhere he wants to uh, at any mm -hmm. time he wants to, and he can disappear whenever he wants to. We don't have to, uh, you know, find some some conglomeration of planets all coming together. And you know, I know there's the I saw the video, the Star of Bethlehem, and I forget the man who made it. He makes a very compelling case. I I have to give him that much. Uh, and he certainly did his homework. You know, and I can't say that it's not possible. But I'm not. I'm not sure that it, that it has to be that way. You know. Again, I think uh, you know, just an angel going from point A to point B would would make things uh, pretty quick. You know, it it simplify things. So. Yeah, I tend to agree. Uh, I've seen that video as well. I've also done research with Stellarium. Uh, it's a free software. People can go to Stellarium.org, download the free software, and it helps you to track the movement of the sun, moon, and stars, planets, and everything throughout history and in the future. Um, and I believe that Revelation 12, I think it's 1 through 5, talks about the woman clothed with the sun and the stars are ahead and the moon at her feet, uh, is a mm -hmm. stellar sign that heralded the birth of Christ. Um, and if that's true, then that alignment happened on September 11th, uh, 3 BC. The software reckons it as negative 2. But what's interesting, if you back the software off to watch the dance of the stars that happens uh, to make that possible is and especially you watch where the moon comes in and you watch where Jupiter comes in and Venus and Mercury that Jupiter uh, who is known as the king planet parks on top of Regulus the king star in Leo the king constellation so there you got your three kings right there <laughs> king 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 stacked right on top of each other and Venus comes up and and sort of mates with her king, so to speak, sits right on top of him, uh, and then Venus leaves Jupiter, and Mercury pops up and follows her, and they and they go down into kind of the upper torso area of, of uh, Virgo, and so you actually end up with really the exact description that you find in Revelation 12 uh, regarding the birth of Christ, but that's only there for like a day or two. I mean, it's, it's you know, you, you can watch the dance happen, and I believe the Magi were schooled in Daniel's school of, of biblical astronomy and looked up and saw it, and, you know, they said, this is the deal. But the thing that they followed, I think, is something different. And I, and I believe that, like you uh, seem to indicate, I believe that it's uh, really actually an angel probably guided them 
you know, and from the earthbound perspective, it looked like a moving star because we do just like you've pointed out, see so many references it to angels being likened unto stars that it seems to make sense. Well, you know, it's also interesting with all of the the so-called UFO activity uh, that we see. I mean, there are, right. I mean, just yeah. count, countless videos on YouTube of people uh, now video videoing with their uh, their yeah. iPhones or whatever. Right. You know, these these glowing orbs up in the sky, and and you know, it's not only some crackpot out in Texas or something. Right. Sorry, hey. about Texas. <laughs> hey, sorry, <laughs> Texas. To uh, I, meant to to say? Say Ar- I meant to say Arkansas or something like that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, well, actually, I meant to say California. <laughs> that's what I meant to say. That's where the real crackpots are. Uh, no, you have the crackpots. We have the, the nuts and flakes. Right. But um, there you go. So anyway, you know, with with all of these things, so these these glowing orbs that are, you know, up there. Uh, well, they're glowing, right? And and they're orbs. They kind of look like stars. And you know, if you had just one of those just going in a particular direction, it would look like a star for all practical purposes. Even sure. if you happen to look up and see a, a satellite going around the Earth, I mean, we know that it's a satellite, mm-hmm. but uh, certainly to someone back then, they wouldn't know what that thing is. But anyway, all I'm trying to say is that you know the Bible has given us the evidence that this is really, it could be, could very well be a star, uh, an angel. It doesn't have to be, you know, the, the the Pleiades system, or does it be a kind of you know a collaboration of planets or something like that? As um, okay. it would fit. So it, okay, but look, we're gonna transition into Revelation chapter two. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> finally! <laughs> Whee! Nice, we made it. Um, All right, we made it. We, we <laughs> so okay, but if we go under the premise that it's an angel here, why would John be writing to an angel? <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, why not? Um, you know, I, I guess you know that's a, that's a fair question. Um, well, I guess on the other hand, <laughs> you could ask this question: If it's intended for humans, how is he going to get it there? Is he going to email it or something? Uh, well, he wrote you know, the book of Revelation. Is... He wrote the book well, of Revelation. Okay. So okay well, this reading, this brings up the now. next. This br- I know, but this brings up the next question. Therefore. The book. Uh, these churches are these are these churches that are going to span throughout the entire two thousand years of church history, mm-hmm. or were these real churches that were alive and well back then, and that needed to hear, uh, you know, the particular messages that they were getting, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. because I, I know that the, the standard uh, dispensational approach is that these are. Uh, these are emblematic of the of the church age. Each one represents a different era of the church age. And now, of course, we're getting pretty close to the last one. And uh, we'd all like to think that we're the Church of Philadelphia or something like that. Mm-hmm. And the other guys, you know, are, are the bad church. Uh, but um, you know, I mean, my take is that these were real churches. They really existed. They needed this message. But the message that they received is something that is rather timeless, and it's applicable to every church out there throughout at any time in church history. You know, mm-hmm. so I think we've always had we've always had the Church of Sardis. Uh, you know, we we've always had the Church of Philadelphia, and we've always had the lukewarm Church of Laodicea. But there really was a Laodicean church. Right, you know, there really was a church of Ephesus, uh, but but these are certainly, uh, you know, these are these are the kinds of church. So I think the Lord picked these because they they were real back then. They were doing what they were doing in time in history, but they were also doing things that were true of any of any uh, any church in the church age. And they were not just, you know, two hundred year spans of well, this is what was happening in this this time in church history. I think that's rather nonsense, to be honest. I could not agree with you more. <laughs> I agree completely with you uh, that this these were physical churches that John was writing to that that he was told to write to, and I believe that we have the privilege of eavesdropping on this conversation. Um, 
perhaps he made seven copies of this book <laughs> uh, when he when he first wrote it. I don't know, but you know he's apparently writing to individual churches that were in existence at the time that John wrote this. Now uh, I think you and I agree on this as well: is that um, these may be applicable to us in the sense of which church would describe us today as individuals. Like, could it be that? You know, we are looking at this now, two thousand years later. Yes, it was written to individual churches that existed in the time that John wrote it. But today, Christians uh, all around the world will fall into various categories according to what is written here. And so it's kind of like, well, is it really church ages? I disagree with that completely. Um, I, I tend to think more that this was this is something that may be personally applicable to us today, and that God mm -hmm. Himself or Jesus the Lamb may be separating us out into, okay, well, sorry, Rob, but, you know, you're kind of fitting into this category <laughs> right now, and I can read that and say, oh, man, he didn't really like that category. I think I want to get out of that one, <laughs> you know. Um, I want to join a different church. Yeah, yeah you always wanna, have the opportunity to join a different church here in these right. two chapters, right? You right. don't have to stay in the one that you're in. In fact, right. you're exhorted to, to, come to out. get out <laughs> of whichever one you're in, except for Philadelphia. Yeah, you, you want to but, be uh, Yeah, exactly, you know. So if you find yourself in any one of these. And so I think you're right. It, it's true on a very personal level, but it's also church. It's also true on a collective church level, maybe like a, an individual congregation. And then it can be also, it could be true of, you know, maybe different states or even countries, you know. So, you know, the, the American church is more or less this kind of church and the the, the, the church in Israel is more or less that kind of church, and the church in Brazil is more or less, you know, something something else. But, but, uh, but still, because you know, the church is always made up of individuals. So this is this is speaking to us, and if we find ourselves uh, really identifying too much with one of these bad churches, then it, it's time to 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 jump ship, really, and um, and, and go for the good ones. So yeah, I, I think that's a great point. Yeah, well, along those lines, looking at this, uh, I'm going to put the screen share back up again here. Looking at this first church here, um, I got King James here on the left, the New American Standard on the right. Uh, I'm going to read the New American Standard so I don't sound like I have a lisp. <laughs> to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this. I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not. And you know to have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake, and have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen, and repent, and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you, and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. What does your ear tell you is happening here, Doug? What is my ear? Oh, Jay, now you put me on the spot. I don't know. What's the answer? I can't think of the answer. <laughs> well, what, what do you Please, think? Please, teacher, you tell think? me the answer. Well, I, I don't claim to be a teacher. I'm, you know, I'm a student I myself. But, but as I look at this, uh, you know, something jumps out at me. There's a group yeah. that Jesus actually hates. And if you look up the Greek yeah. word, I forget what the word is, but it, I, when, I, when I did look it up, it was about as strong a word as you can get for, like, I mean, abhor. I mean, he hates yeah. the Nicolaitans. So yeah. when I first yeah. saw that, I'm like, well, I want to know what the Nicolaitans are because I don't want to be one. <laughs> you know, um, I, I, I have something to share on that, but I, I'd like to get your take on it. What's your take on the Nicolaitans and the fact uh, that Jesus I'd rather them? I'd rather just hear what you have to say first. <laughs> okay. I can see. It. I'll give it to you. You get the floor. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm not gonna take up all the time on this, but uh, I actually did a whole study on this back on my virtual house church uh, week 37. So people could go to. If they want to really read the whole thesis. They could go to virtualhousechurch.com, and then on the left-hand manual, just scroll down to where it says Numbers week 37, and in here I actually address the issue of the Nicolaitans because I really wanted to know. What's the deal with these people? Uh, and we mm -hmm. see them again in Revelation uh, 2, verse 13. We just saw you know, the earlier verses of chapter 2, but it, it shows up again. 
Um, and we see that in Revelation 2.13, I know that you live in the city where Satan has his throne. Uh, the seat of Satan was the altar of Zeus in Pergamum. Uh, mm -hmm. So right there, you know, the, there's a stronghold there. Satan's got a stronghold there uh, in this place. And we see that, you know, I quote, uh, the Nicolaitans show up in uh, Revelation 2, 6, and 15. Well, when I looked into it, uh, let's, I'll just go ahead and read some of this here. Um, let's begin with Revelation 2, 6, where Jesus told the church of Ephesus, but this thou hast in your favor, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Jesus was proud of the church of Ephesus for their hatred of the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which he also hated. The word hate is a strong word, so let's see exactly what it means. Okay, I put it in here. It comes from the Greek word missio, which means to hate, to abhor, or to find utterly repulsive. It describes a person who has a deep-seated animosity, who is antagonistic to something he finds to be completely objectionable. He not only loathes that subject, but rejects it entirely. This is not just a case of dislike. It is a case of actual hatred. Well, when you keep going and look into Nicolaitan, we see that Nicolaitan is derived from the Greek word Nikolaos, a compound of the word Nikos and Laos. The word Nikos is the Greek word that means conquer or to subdue, and the word Laos is the Greek word for the people. That's where we get a lot of times you hear people say, well, that's lording over the people. Um, and that's certainly an accurate translation uh, of that name. Uh, but it's also indicative of pretty much the entire church of today, where you got one guy at the front lording over everybody else, and you, you're not allowed to raise your hand in church and say, um, Pastor, I'm not sure that that's what that text is talking about right there. Could it be, you know, like we're doing here, where we're sharpening iron, sharpening iron, and we're bouncing ideas? You can't do that. No, you've got to sit there and be quiet and listen to one guy. But as you look further into this, you see that the Nicolaitans came from an individual named Nicholas, who is mentioned in Acts 6.5. And uh, he's one of the, if you look at Acts 6-5, and the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. So we see that he was a convert. He was a Gentile convert who lived in a region uh, that was thoroughly entrenched in paganism and the worship of false gods and things of that nature. Um, and so I'm not going to go through and read all of this, but if you want to check out, there's a whole commentary on who he was and what other people have researched concerning him. But we see that the Nicolaitans are also, in the book of Revelation chapter 2, compared to uh, Balaam. And if you look at the story of Balaam, you'll see that he taught the Israelites to go against the instructions of Jehovah. He taught them to go contrary to the Torah. That has caused many people to also look at this and realize that the Nicolaitans were practitioners of antinomianism, which comes from the Greek word meaning lawless. In Christian theology, you know, we would think of it as lawlessness. And so he was both, uh, his system uh, uh, was basically one of lording over the masses and advocating a hyper grace message to the point where you have a license to sin and there's no problem with it. Let's go ahead and continue doing our pagan rituals that we love to do so much because grace covers it all. Um, and so when I looked at that, I thought, well, that's kind of a problem because in my experience, anybody who's followed me on Facebook will know anytime I post anything that even remotely hints at maybe obeying God, uh, I'm called a legalist and a Judaizer and all kinds of other things. And I'm thinking, well, looking at the history of the Nicolaitans, they are people who taught a hyper-grace message and, and, and advocated for a license to sin and lorded over the masses and continued to preach to their people that message. Um, mm. that's well, this funny. is... Uh... <laughs> yeah, this is going to... Boy, oh boy. I thought the last post was troubling, but now we're going to have... <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh boy, I wonder if I should like stand back again. <laughs> well, There's you know, your target, Rob, right there. No, there but we you, go. you raised go. some... You raise some I know, well, you raised some, really some really good points, uh, very uncomfortable kind of points, because you know what you're saying is that really the entire model that we are using here in America and many parts of the world uh, is, a, is, a, is a kind of model that the Lord is not at all pleased with. Exactly. Um, and, and I will just concur that uh, yeah, the, the word, uh, you know, Nico is from the word, uh, it's like Nike, right? It's the, the god of, 
of victory. So it's it's victory or conquer over the people. So you, you're totally legit in that. Um, now you were saying that this was a hyper grace message. I'm I'm curious where you were getting that. Uh, well, was it, it from it's the it, it's the whole idea that we are covered by grace, therefore the law is irrelevant. Uh, you don't need to do it anymore. Um, I mean, <laughs> it's basically it's a Crowleyan philosophy of do as thou wilt. That is the whole of the law because we are covered in grace. You know, mm. it's it's not something for us to be concerned with because we we're covered in the blood, which is true. We are. Um, but even Paul says, should you know, let's go to let's go ahead and pop this back up here. You know, Paul says in Romans 6, 1 and 2, what shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? God forbid, right? Uh, mm -hmm. we're, we, we, yeah, we have grace, and we're covered in the blood, and man, it's great, because if we fail, if we you know, sin, uh, the, the Apostle John defines sin in uh, 1 John um, 3, I believe it is. I'd have to check real quick, but I think 1 John 3 defines sin as transgression of the law. So, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know any Christian that would advocate for sin, but yet they constantly advocate against the law. Well, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is transgression of the law. So if we are going to not sin, then we got to obey the law. Do you see what mm. I'm saying? But, but everybody's saying, no, yeah. We, yeah. we're done with the law. And, um, and from no. what I could tell from my research, and again, I, I'm putting the information out, and I encourage people to research what I have searched, read the whole commentary that I put on virtualhousechurch.com concerning the Nicolaitans, and then take a hard look at, A, yourself, and the churches that you belong to. Because I think you're going to find that, and I found this to be true myself, uh, both of myself as well as some of the churches that I was involved in, that they appear, according to the historical documentation of a Nicolaitan, to be following that model. Wow. Yeah. Well, good. I, I was just thinking we're agreeing on way too many things, and <laughs> our show just might get a little bit our show just might get a little bit boring. But this should keep it exciting. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? I, I was oh, reading uh, Deuteronomy chapter thirty today, and I actually um, posted it on my uh, Facebook page. Uh, and Deuteronomy chapter thirty is a call to return to the Lord. And one of the things that you commonly hear from people whenever you mention the commandments is, "It's impossible for us to keep it. There's no way we can keep the commandments." And I'm like, "Well, then Moses had to be a complete lunatic and completely out of his mind, because he said in verse eleven of chapter thirty, "This command I'm giving you today is not too difficult for you to understand. It is not beyond your reach. It is not kept in heaven so distant that you must ask, who will go up to heaven and bring it down so we can hear and obey? It is not kept beyond the sea so far away that you must ask, who will cross the sea to bring it to us so we can hear it and obey? No, the message is very close at hand. It is on your lips and in your heart so that you can obey it. And then, of course, we see later that John said, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. So, you know, either these people are completely out of their mind, or they're telling us something here that is actually obtainable, that we actually can do these things. And, and when I think of the Ten Commandments, I'm not talking about the rabbinic notion of 613. Um, I'm talking about the Ten Commandments because when Moses was commanded to build a tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant and all that, um, he, he was shown a blueprint of something in heaven that he was to emulate here on earth. And you see what goes into the, ten, into the Ark of the Covenant is the Ten Commandments. And at least as, I can, as far as I can tell, the 613 are essentially just an elaboration on the 10 with some added Le Levitical stuff, you know, that the priests need to do and whatnot. Um, but people will always say, well, we just have to do what Jesus said. He just had two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. What, what most Christians don't understand is Yeshua was actually quoting the Torah when he said that, and he was basically mm -hmm. boiling down all 10 into two. And John That's defines right. love the Lord your God. How do you love your Lord? How do you love God? John says for it, for those who are confused, for this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. Yet ninety percent of the church is out there saying toss this stuff out, while at the same time 
going going psycho whenever somebody tries to take the Ten Commandments out of our school or public buildings. It's a total, you know, contradiction in my mind. Yeah, <laughs> boy, that is that is so true. I I think you said it very well. Yeah, we are kind of schizophrenic in this area, where yeah. Yeah, you take the Ten Commandments away, and we're like, oh, no, you can't do that. But then we're like, well, I'm not going to keep them because I'm not under the law anymore. And I just right. want to point out, Mike is 6'8". Here's another condensation of the law down to three. You mm -hmm. know, he has shown you, oh, man, what is good, what the Lord does require of you to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. You know, when you think about all those laws, think of it like an accordion. You have really two hands, okay? You've got love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And then love your neighbor as yourself, which, like you said, is from the Torah. It's from Leviticus 19, uh, 7. Okay, so you know, in case you don't know how to do that, you just start to open up the accordion. Okay, I love the Lord my God by not having any other gods before Him, by not uh, taking His name in vain, by not making any graven images, by keeping the Sabbath, and then how do I love the, and even you know uh, honoring your my father and my mother, you could sort of argue which side that goes on the accordion, but still, hmm. um, you know, then how to love my neighbor, well, I'm not going to kill him, okay, I'm not going to murder him, I'm not going to lie about him, I'm not going to take his wife, and I'm not going to covet his things, I'm not going to, uh, you know, just these different things that I could do, I'm not going to do those. And if you still have questions, well, how do I love my neighbor? Well, I'll tell you what, you know what, if you build a house, and you are going to have guests up on your roof, well, goodness, put a, uh, put a banister around your house, around your roof, so that people can't fall off. That's being pretty loving, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And you know what? Uh, you love your neighbor, you love your, your, your family, well, don't let mold grow in your house. That's pretty loving. Okay? I mean, so here are some, some, th some ways, very practical ways, that you can love your neighbor. You see your, your neighbor's uh, donkey in the ditch, on a Saturday, well, go get the thing out. Wouldn't you want him to do the same for you? So, and you know, I'll tell you what. When it comes to the Ten Commandments, uh, I can't really think of really any Christian that has an issue with the Ten Commandments, except, except when you say for number keep four. Them. <laughs> yeah, especially it, well, no, four. but you know, but you, you mean, nobody, nobody's like, oh, we think murder is okay now, or we think that adultery is okay now. I mean, you'll you, you'll never hear. I mean, I've never heard any Christian say, oh, it's it's okay now. To uh, to have graven images, or now it's okay to um, to covet. You know, we're still like, oh, those are still bad. It's number four that really starts to get on people's nerves. Okay, and of course, number four is is the keeping of the Shabbat. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, that's that's the one that they're really railing against. It's not the others, right? Because they're like, yeah, we shouldn't lie, we shouldn't steal. Right, I mean, those are the ones. It's it's number four, the Shabbat, that people are like. Well, I'm not under law anymore, and I can do whatever I want. Paul told Paul told me I can have any day off I want, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, that's really the issue. Boy, this is going to really get us in trouble, Rob. Thanks a well, lot. Well, you know what? If I'm yeah, if, if I'm going to get in <laughs> trouble for encouraging people to obey God, then so be it. <laughs> um, Amen. Because you know what, you know. People say it's impossible, and I'm like, well, you know, what? If it's so impossible, why did these guys write the things that they wrote? I mean, and and if we fail, this is what John says, and I love this. First John chapter two, uh, beginning of verse one. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. You mean it's possible to not sin? Well, John says so right here. Is it a sharpie or a highlighter? I've highlighted it. And if someone sins, if you do screw up, guess what? We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. And then he says something really peculiar here, and I want people to take notice of this. It says in verse 3, By this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. <laughs> so if you're going to say you know him, this is the litmus test right here. The one who says, I have come to know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. You're a Nicolaitan. Okay, how, how how would you answer though that um, you know it says th this is the commandment of God that you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that God has sent. So how no could problem. that be su sufficient? I mean, it, that's what I've heard people argue that well, 
and the, the command is to to believe in the Lord. That's, that's it, you know. But, well, that's a nice cherry pick, but there's uh, 66 more books to look through, <laughs> and all of them are full of exhortations to obey the Father. <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, we, uh, people want to yeah. quote Paul all the time. Everybody quotes Paul, but, you know, let's consider Paul what he said in 1 Corinthians 2.16. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Oh, Okay, so if we claim to be believers, and Paul says, as believers, we have the mind of Christ, let me ask you, when did Yeshua ever have in mind to disobey his father? Hmm. That would be, that would be, oh, like, uh, never. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, all right, fair enough. <laughs> so, I'm, if, he walked in complete if he walked in complete obedience to his father, ought we not to walk the same way? And John tells us that. You know, he says that we should. And if we screw up, which we will, great, no problem. That's what grace is for. And I would suggest that grace has always been a part of the plan. It's not something that just, you know, was invented when Yeshua showed up. We see in um, Exodus 34, verses 5 through 7 in the Torah, And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, I'm going to say, Yehovah, Yehovah, God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. So God is just, but he's also full of mercy, grace, love, and forgiveness. Grace and law have always been together. You cannot have one without the other. I would contend that law without grace is tyranny, and grace without law is anarchy. It's anything goes. You have to have both, and I would say that they have both always been together. That the that, that it wasn't invented in the New Testament. It's always been there. Yeah, thank you for saying that because uh, there really is this huge misconception that you know the the God of the Old Testament. He's a pretty mean guy. But we're so glad that the new New Testament came along, because boy, we'd still be under that law if it weren't for, you know, for all that. But you know, people that were under the law, it, it, first of all, it was not an onerous kind of thing. Uh, yeah. It was never that the law was ever bad. It was never intended to give you eternal life. That was not. That's not the point of it. I mean, if you you, know, you drive the speed limit, it doesn't mean you're going to get eternal life. It, it's there as a safeguard. You know, right. I mean, I'm glad that we have laws. I'm glad that we're all supposed to stop when a red light comes along because we've seen the effects of what happens when you don't stop at a red light. People exactly. die. I yeah. mean, look at that train that just uh, crashed the other day in Spain, or, uh, Spain right? Uh, yeah. It was going, what, twice the speed limit of what it was supposed to go around that curve, and now yeah. 80 people are dead. I mean, that's what happens when you don't obey the law. You know, that guy right. should be... You know, he, he should be charged with manslaughter because he was completely negligent. Uh, right. You know, so the, the law is good for us. It keeps us safe. It keeps us out of danger. When you see a sign next to a cliff and says, don't go beyond the fence, it's there not to spoil your day. You say, well, I want to go beyond the fence, man. That's not fair. There's no freedom in that. Where's the grace, you know? Uh, you know the great the grace comes along when the guys you know get a helicopter and bail you out from that that tree limb you're hanging by off, off the edge of the cliff. You yeah. know when you shouldn't have been there in the first place. That's called grace, but mm -hmm. that's also called you're being stupid, right? And yeah. uh, the whole reason that you're not supposed to do that is so you don't have to get bailed out. What did what did God say? To uh, Saul, he says, "I I desire obedience rather than sacrifice." Okay, you know, sacrifice will will always be part of the deal because you know we are who we are, and and just like if you're a parent and you have kids, you'd much rather that they just do what you ask. Uh, will there be times when you have to say, you know, I forgive you, uh, you know, all right, you know, you, you messed up, I, it, it's over, I'm forgetting about it already, but there there's still a loss. I mean, you know, when my when my kids break my dishes. Uh, I don't remain mad all day, but I'd rather they don't break my dishes, you know, because then I, gotta, I can, there's a cost involved, you know. There's there's yeah. a real cost involved with that. And when we break God's law, there's a cost. Someone will incur the cost. 
Now, thankfully, Jesus was willing to pick up the tab, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean he wants us to keep breaking the dishes, as it were. He's exactly. like, okay, you know, enough of that. Uh, I'm not gonna. I mean, you know, you, you you throw the thing on the on the floor once, okay, I, you know, I, that's okay. Uh, you happen to knock it off the table again, okay, I forgive you. And if you you're just clumsy all day, I'll, I'll keep forgiving you. But if you start taking those plates and you're just throwing them across the room, you know, well, gee, that's that's I'm gonna take you out. You know, if you're my kid. Uh, I'm going to tie you up and not let you do that anymore because I don't feel like buying a whole new thing of plates. So, you know, I think there's something in there where, um, you know, essentially this is what we're looking at. And the law was given not to stifle our lives. It was given to, to help us have parameters on how to live a successful life. Amen. I mean, and I don't just mean, I don't just mean in the financial sense or anything like that, but, but you know, how to have, how to have life, how to have peace, how to have uh, uh, you know peace of mind and and to um, how to be righteous and I, I think part of what it comes down to Rob is we've we've lost our appreciation for the word righteousness we we mm. sort of treat it as a as a dirty word and say well I'm just under grace man uh, you know grace covers all my sins and it does mm. but it still has never been and will never be a license to go on sitting and I think Paul's really trying to make that clear so it's not about in fact you know even in Romans he talks about how even those that don't even have the law uh, the law that they have they don't have the mosaic law but they do have this natural law they have things built into their own hearts they have a conscience and that it, right there in itself is a law unto itself so they already know because it's built within them that they're not supposed to murder somebody. They know that they're, it's not right to lie. So even though it's not on paper for them, but they know that there are certain things you just you're not supposed to do, it. and it, it's like hardwired into us. Mm -hmm. So you know here God is just coming out and telling us, or, you know, through the Jews what we what we are to do and what we are not to do. In case there's yeah. any question about it, but but it was never a way that you could actually be uh, freed from this bondage of corruption. And I think part of the issue too is that we, when Paul talks about the law of death, that some people have may have equated that with the the Mosaic law, but it's not. The Mosaic law is not the law of death. All That's right. right. The Mo Mosaic law is the law of bondage that we have all been bo uh, born into. That's the law of death that he's talking about. Yeah, in fact, uh, I'm going to go back to, I pre I'm glad you said that actually, I'm going to go back to Deuteronomy chapter 30 and uh, what I put on my Facebook page uh, because it is, a lot of people do wrongly think that when they hear the word law and the curse of the law and all that stuff, that they're saying the law is a curse. <laughs> Absolutely that is not true. Disobedience to the law brings a curse, and that was what was put on to Yeshua. Uh, he paid the price for the, the curse of transgression of the law. But we see all through the scriptures, specifically in the Torah itself, that the Torah, and I don't even like using the word law, it's a terrible translation. It should be instructions, um, essentially. Yes. But uh, in Deuteronomy 30, verse 15, now listen, today I am giving you a choice between life and death, between prosperity and disaster. For I command you this day to love the Lord your God and keep his commandments, decrees, and regulations by walking in his ways. If you do this, you will live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are about to enter and occupy. And then he's skipping down to verse 19. Today I have given you the choice between life and death, and I love this, <laughs> and between blessings and cursings. And he goes, choose life. <laughs> I mean, I'm giving you a choice here between... Life and yeah. death. I'll tell you what, choose life. <laughs> so, I mean, let, clearly. Well, let, me re, let, me, let me follow this up uh, with this verse here. I think it, it just it goes so well. This is Romans chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, just what you said, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And so, and here's what I want to say. It's not, it's not the law which is sin and is death. It's the law of sin and death. So that's one yeah. phrase, the law of sin and death, okay? Just like yes. you can have 
uh, the law of of uh, of you know returns. Okay, the law of you know whatever law you're talking about, the law of gravity. Okay, let's let's say that. So now we're not talking about the law, which includes gravity. It's called the law of gravity. That's one term. And so here we have the law of sin and death. That's one term that's being used here. Uh, and it's, um, in fact, uh, this is even, I can just, uh, um, I want to just kind of bring this out here that um, there's something known as the, um, the Granville Sharp. We have the law of sin and of death, which is um, this one word is here is being used for the law of sin and of death. So it's it's referring to both, and they're all connected here to this word law. I hope that enlightens somebody. But <laughs> uh, you can kind of look it up. The Granville Sharp rule. Uh, it's a it's a Greek thing. But anyway, I didn't explain it too well. But anyway, my my point here is that. It's not just any old law. It's not. It's not talking about the Torah. It's not talking about the law that was given to Moses. Paul is not railing against the law of Moses here. He's talking about the law of sin and death. And then later in the same chapter, I think this is what is going to really just kind of bring this out for us, because he says in verse 19 and actually start in 20, it says for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Right. So that's the kind of law of death that we're talking about. And so, you know, I, I just thought that underscored what you're saying very well. And it's unfortunate that, that we have such a mixed up view of what the law is. Amen. You know, it's, it's so bizarre because Christians will... Will, will really advocate for that we must be good citizens of our country and obey the laws of the land and listen to our elected officials and blah, blah, blah. But as soon as you suggest the idea of obeying God, oh, you're a legalist, you're, you're a Judaizer. Um, you mentioned righteousness earlier, and, and I want to mention one other thing that I don't think people understand, and that's holiness. Um, and I'm going to point people to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. For by one offering, of course, that would be the death of Yeshua on the cross, he has perfected or made righteous forever, uh, for all time, those who are being made holy or those who are sanctified. And so we have our righteousness through Christ. You know, it's, it's not of works, it's lest any man should boast. There's nothing I can do to obtain uh, the kind of righteousness that would lead to going to heaven. Uh, you know, and being in right standing with God, only being covered in the blood of a lamb. You know, though my sins be as scarlet, they are made white as snow because I'm covered in the lamb, uh, the, the sacrifice to, for sin. So that made me righteous. I'm, I, I have no righteousness of my own, but I have righteousness through him. However, I am being made holy. Well, how am I being made holy? The only way you're holy or set apart or sanctified is to whatever degree you do that which God, God calls holy, sanctified, and set apart. And where do we find that? Well, we find that in his instruction manual, which is the Bible of the Bible called the Torah. So, uh, you know, some people say, well, you're holier than thou. I say, Thank you. <laughs> because that's actually a compliment. Uh, if, if keeping the Sabbath makes me holier than thou, great. You know, uh, because to whatever degree I'm doing that which God says is holy, set apart, and sanctified, i.e. the Sabbath in, in this instance, uh, then I am being made holy. Hmm. You know, I, I, was just, uh, I was just contemplating this right here, uh, this word being sanctified, um, because in, 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 the, in the Greek, you have the passive and the middle... Uh, are really one and the same in many many places, and um, this one, uh, you know, I'm wondering if we could even just translate it: those who are sanctifying themselves. And if we yes. throw out the word "sanctify," okay, let's just throw that out because you know we start thinking, "Oh, you're so holy." You know, we think like holy means perfect, but it mm -hmm. doesn't. It right. doesn't mean perfect. It means set apart. And I think That's we right. should leave the definition at that. Amen. Because you know, 
the word holy, the word you know, uh, sanctify or you know, saint. These are all the same word. All right, they're the same word uh, as the word kadosh in Hebrew. And uh, I've I've pointed out a, a, a time or two on 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 my uh, my radio show and and my Bible studies that the word holy or, or kadosh in Hebrew it doesn't mean per morally perfect, okay? Because uh, the, the the same root, uh, the same word, uh, a word of the same root, kadesh, a kadesh was somebody who was a temple prostitute. And I hardly think that a Kadesh was somebody who was morally perfect. Uh, she was just she was set apart for a particular purpose, okay? But she wasn't morally perfect. Uh, so you know, so you know, I wonder if we could even translate it. I'm just kind of thinking off the top of my head here. But in Hebrews 10:14, he has perfected forever those who are sanctifying, those who are setting themselves apart, okay? And that would be pretty interesting, okay? Because you know that would 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 put a little bit more of the um, a little more responsibility back on us, all right? You know, he you're you're perfect, all right? He did it. Yes. But that that requires you to continue to be set apart, all right? Yes. And you know that would really square pretty well with what Jesus talks about the four different kinds of soil, right? Mm -hmm. And you know some people receive the word. But then the riches of this life choke it out, you know, and so they they do not remain or do they not continue to set themselves apart for the Lord? Oh my, this could really be an interesting. <laughs> I'm gonna have to really get to the bottom of this. You you got me thinking now. Yeah. Um, because you know I think you know this certainly goes hand in hand with with the once saved always saved kind of deal. And look, I, I firmly believe that Jesus did everything necessary for me to be saved. Okay, I Amen. cannot add to my salvation in any way. Amen. But there's all these exhortations to press on, to keep going. Right? He who endures to the end will be saved. Uh, Work we out see your that salvation. In, in exactly. Fear and trembling. Exactly. You know. So there's. Uh, you know, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you don't, then you're clearly a liar, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. Even there in Revelation, uh, Revelation two, where we started our our discussion, was, uh, you know, they're talking about. Um, he says, uh, I'm trying to find his here. Um, you know, you you persevere to persevere, and then he who overcomes, he says, to him who overcomes. This is uh, two seven. I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of paradise of God. So, uh, to him who overcomes, Jesus will give. Well, what about those who don't overcome? Well, I guess you don't get to eat from the tree of life. That seems to be the implication, you right. know. So there's a lot. There's a lot to that. And he even says, you know, hey, if you don't repent, you guys, you know, you used to love me. Go back to your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yeah, I mean, what this is, is repentance. I mean, repentance is turning from sin. What is sin? Sin is mm -hmm. transgression of the law, which is what the Nicolaitans were apparently teaching. Yeah, let me just go to Revelation 3.3. 3. It's really a similar idea. Remember, therefore, how you have... How you have you ha how you have received and heard, hold fast and repent. So there's the same message. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. Okay, this is going to segue us in a little bit into uh, some talk here about the rapture. Uh oh. Because I know, I know. <laughs> this this term. I want to clarify something because. The, the the phrase uh, coming as a thief has been used to talk about the rapture of the believer, mm. and the term you know he'll come as a thief has nothing absolutely nothing to do with the rapture of the believer. All right, and I want to start our discussion in First Thessalonians chapter five, where Paul says, "But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren." You have no need that I should write to you, 
For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Now this is where people will often stop and say, well, see, we can't know anything about it. We don't know when the rapture is going to happen. Therefore, uh, he's coming like a thief in the night. And this is where we get you know, movies like A Thief in the Night. Okay, and and Keep you know reading. people are one minute one minute they're they're shaving and the next they're Oof. gone. Okay, I know he says, but in verse four, but you brethren are not in darkness, yeah. so that this day should overtake you as a thief. Okay, so look, uh, as a believer, if Jesus comes to me like a thief in the night, that means I'm that, in big big trouble. All right, that's a problem. So he, <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's not coming as a thief in the night. And uh, so we got the verse I just read in Revelation 3.3. 3. And then I think one that really drives home the argument is in Revelation 16. And this one is sandwiched between yeah. some pretty amazing things. All right, you yes. got Revelation 16.14. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to battle of that great day of God Almighty Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments. And then he says, and they gather them together in the place called in, he in Hebrew Armageddon. All right, so Jesus is talking to who? Who is he talking to? I mean, is he talking to, um, I mean, he's not talking to the believer, really. He's talking to the people that are going to join with this confederation. Uh, you know, I mean, it's like it's this, it's this huge warning Hey, I'm coming as a thief to those who are not watching, and you know this is uh, this is really incredible. I, I got just one more verse I want to share, and this is in Second Peter three ten. It says, "But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up." So partly this also. You know, leads us into the question of what is the day of the Lord? Uh, classic dispensationalism, or at least pre-tribulational pre rapture dispensationalism, that's a mouthful, uh, mm -hmm. views the day of the Lord as being the seven years of the tribulation. I reject that. Likewise. And the day of the Lord is the day that Jesus comes back. It's not the whole seven years. It's not even the, the latter three and a half years. That's called the time of Jacob's trouble. But the day that Jesus comes back is the day of the Lord, and that day is coming as a thief. And what Jesus said in Revelation 16 completely underscores that, because when those spirits go out to bring the nations of the earth together, that's at, that's at the tail end of the time of Jacob's trouble. So we're at, we're at pretty close to the end of the, the seven-year seven year period. And he's, he's still saying, I'm coming back as a thief. These guys are kind of clueless. They're not getting it. They're still going on with their machinations. They think that they're going to have this incredible victory by destroying the Jewish people. And he's like, hey, I'm coming back as a thief. Watch out, man. Well, I'm coming. You better watch it. And then, of course, the heavens are going to roll up like a scroll. That's the heavens passing away with a great noise. And suddenly, everyone is scared, uh, scared stiff, okay? And that's why you have in Revelation 6, this is what I think we began our discussion on the book of Revelation, Rob, with this whole thing that the book of Revelation is not in chronological order. Mm -hmm. And, you know, once we can see that, because in Revelation 6, we're in the sixth seal, then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up and every mount, mountain and island was moved out of its place. How do I know this is really coming at the end? Because look at the response. Uh, everyone goes and hides themselves in the rocks and the mountains. And what do they say? Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? You see, I mean, they're in Revelation 16. They're all cocky. They think, oh, yeah, man, we're going to do our thing. We're not scared at all. And then the heavens recede like a scroll. And guess what? Everyone is scared stiff because now they're like, oh, my goodness, there he is. He's coming. You know, they become true believers uh, in, in who Jesus is at this point, you know. So the day of the Lord is the day that Jesus comes back. The thief in the night motif is talking to those who are, are, are not believers. And again, just to, to get back there to, to uh, Revelation chapter 3, he's saying, you know, 
you need to repent or I'm going to come upon you as a thief. So you need, you need to, um, you know, what, and what we see here is that this is a church, this is a church, this church of Sardis, um, you know, they, they think that they're Christians, they think they're alive, but actually they're dead. And, uh, you know, you, you've got a few things that remain, but they're ready to die. Uh, your, your works are not perfect, so it's time to repent. So, you know, kind of going back to the law discussion, uh, this, I, I just thought that I would, I would throw that in there because I think it, it underscores what you're saying. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm glad you brought up the, the thief in the night thing because when I started looking into it, I mean, there's so many, especially pre-trib rapture guys out there say, he's coming as a thief in the night, he's coming as a thief in the night. I'm like, did you actually read your Bible? Because, like, every time he says that, it's always to the sleeping, the slothful, the bad guys. It's, and, it's, and I would say it's Christians just as much as it is uh, non-Christians because there are plenty of Christians out there who aren't paying attention, that aren't studying the Torah. All, he's, Isaiah 46.10 says he declares the end from the beginning. So if you want to understand the end, you got to go back to the beginning. You mentioned Revelation 16, uh, verse 15, where he says, Behold, I'm coming as a thief, and it says... The next verse or next part in the sentence says, "Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame." That actually goes back to the Torah, to Leviticus chapter six verses eight through thirteen, regarding the night watchman. Where if you go back to Leviticus chapter six verses eight through thirteen, he it's funny because the clothing that these guys are told to wear is highly flammable clothing and yet they're the ones tasked to keep the fire burning. It says repetitively they must keep the night fire burning. And there was a uh, tradition that the high priest would sneak up on the night priest at some unknown time during the night and he would check to see if he was sleeping or if he was doing his job. And if he was sleeping the high priest would take a burning ember from the altar and then touch it to the highly flammable clothes that the priest was wearing. And, of course, the priest would go up in flames, so he would shed his clothes very quickly and run out naked. That's what this is talking about here. We're supposed to be watching. We're supposed to be doing our job. We're supposed to be in walking in obedience. And, you know, God gives us these instructions, wrongly called the law, but it's instructions for us in the Torah, which you, you mentioned First Thessalonians, and I love that because everybody's like, yeah, he's coming as a thief in the night, but, like, keep reading, you know, the next few verses. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that they, they should take, overtake you like a thief. Ye are children of the light and children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. The only ones he's coming to as a thief in the night are those who are disobedient and not doing the instructions. They're not going to be at the right place at the right time doing what God told them to do, which is one of the reasons why I think it's so imperative for us to understand the feasts of God, uh, and Mark Biltz talked about this at the Prophecy Summit in Colorado. I was so happy. I was listening to him I'm like, yes, because he was saying that's the calendar. That's what God is following. It's a script. They are called Moedim, the appointed times. Those are the days he does stuff on. But if you're busy doing Christmas and Easter and throwing out the Torah, you're not going to be at the right place at the right time when he shows up for the second time. I mean, he, he fulfilled the spring feast to the letter. Died on Passover, buried on unleavened bread, uh, rose on first fruits, Holy Spirit came down on Pentecost. He's got a good track record. So if he landed on each of the, the feasts of his first coming perfectly, it stands to reason that in his second coming he's going to as well. But only those who are watching, I mean, that implies we have something to watch for, which I would say are the Moedim. Um, and sadly, too many in the church are not watching, and that's what scares me. I mean, we see in Matthew chapter um, 5, I'm just going to put this up, I know we're like way over time here, but I'm having fun. So <laughs> we see in Matthew 5, 16 through 19, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill, i.e. fill in full. Do it completely. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Now, I mean, I'm just going to put myself back on here and look out the window. Yep, earth and heaven still here. So um, clearly <laughs> the law hasn't been done away with yet. But this is what that verse 19 uh, really catches my attention. Matthew 5, 19. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least of these commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do 
i.e., by implication, we have the ability to do the commandments and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And, you know, just by the responses on my Facebook page on a regular basis, anytime I post anything to do with the law, there's going to be a lot of janitors in heaven. I mean, not to, not to <laughs> talk down on anybody out there that may be in that capacity of work, but uh, I'm just saying, there, there's clearly a hierarchy in the kingdom, and there are those who are going to be considered great and those who are not going to be considered great. And the ones who are not going to be considered great are the Nicolaitans. They're the ones that are advocating against the instructions of our Father. Wow. Well, uh, this gives us a lot of things to think about. Uh, you know, we, we pray that everybody out there will just take the time to consider the verses, to, you know, be the Berean. Uh, like you, like we, we named our show, this is a quest for truth. We do not have the corner on truth. We know the Bible is true, and that's why we want to go back and take a look at it. And you know what? The Really, the bottom line is, what is reality? What is reality? And if reality is to keep God's law, and that's what he keeps saying, then we need to deal with that. And you know we want to we want to do everything that God tells us to do. And you know what? Not only because boy we have to, and otherwise we're in big trouble. You know what? There's blessing. There's great great blessing involved when we do what our Father asks us to do. I mean, he, life. you know, life. Yeah, I mean, life here, life or death. What are you going to take? Well, I don't know. I think I'll take death. You know, <laughs> no. I Choose mean, life. Here's <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, really. You know, it, it should be pretty obvious, but somehow we've been duped. Uh, you know, and the bottom line is we don't want to change because we, we like our works of darkness, and that's where we have to repent. So, well, we are out of time. It's been uh, an enjoyable show, uh, for me at least, and I yeah. uh, hope for everyone out there as well. Until next time, keep searching, keep on your quest for truth, and we look forward to next time. May God bless. Bye.